Thank you. I, I get used to being the, the one non-marine person working in my establishment in Southampton. Um, so there we are in East Greenland, standing on the top of uh, Celsius Berg. And I'll start with fish. Um, obviously, people count mollusks and, and things like that. Uh, this is a very good compilation uh, by Laura Salon. And um, you can, what you can see is the colours change. So as you go through all these records of fish in the mid and late Devonian, all of a sudden it goes from green to blue. It doesn't change with the Kelvassa, it changes with the Hangenberg, and it changes with that DC boundary. So it's a rather major uh, terrestrial extinction event. That's the, uh, the land plants as the spores. That's the record from Bantry Bay in Ireland by Paul Van Vane. And again, what you can see is a sudden change um, where lots of things disappear and lots of things appear. So there's very much uh, a, a, a match terrestrial uh, extinction in the vertebrates and in the plants. Um, we've got some very interesting spores at the DC boundary. Obviously, I would say that. Um, but this is a thing called Retispora lepidophyta. And if there's ever a spore you should know the name of, it's this one. Um, it's incredibly distinctive. It's just full of little holes, which are real and not pyrite. And um, it's found everywhere from equator to pole in that late Devonian for a very short time period. So it's an incredibly successful plant. It's some sort of ruderal or weed. Uh, we don't know what it comes from. It's probably a little lycopod. But the severity of the extinction is the ultimate survivor disappears and, and, it, and it gets knocked out. So it's like bracken, in effect. It's able to go anywhere and do anything, but it disappears at this boundary. Um, this is a reminder about the, glacia the glaciations. Um, there's East Greenland. Um, there's a record. This is the uh, Buco compilation. And you've got the high-latitude uh, tillites, diamictites up here. But there's one record which just sneaks in there into Maryland in, in the States. Um, and so we have this very short, severe glaciation. And uh, hopefully I'll show you an equally short, severe warming up which parallels it. And that's just to remind you, uh, that's John Lakin at Lake Titicaca looking at striated surfaces uh, within sediments. That's a lone dropstone in Kentucky. Those were long known and thought to be quaternary. I mean, one turned up encased in rock. Um, what I wanted us all to do as a trip was to lift it up and put a dollar bill underneath uh, for future posterity and to cause trouble uh, with creationists. Um, <laughs> this is East Greenland, and the great thing about it is you're in the middle of the old red sandstone continent. You're not on the margin, um, and so what happens here is the extremity. It's like being in Death Valley, um, and so when things get wet, you know about it, and you know it's an extreme. And it's dominated by these dry land rivers. Uh, everything's red. And, and there's a lot of red rock there. Um, I'm standing more or less on the boundary uh, of Franian. Uh, Franian Fermenian boundary lies in between there, and but sort of the end of that fjord, about 20 kilometres away, is more or less still in the Fermenian. So it, it just goes on forever, uh, which brings its own problems. Um, we looked at sedimentation rates. Uh, there was a lot of rock. Uh, if you believe the figures, it's up to 8 kilometres thickness. Um, but you're never certain if that's a true vertical thickness. And you can get some colossal sedimentation rates. So what it gives you is a very good resolution of what's happening through geological time. Um, so there's a number of DC boundary sections we've managed to get hold of uh, over the years, uh, basically through the basin. And it's all in this lake, which is the marker, and you can follow it. You can see the, the scale of it, 20 kilometres. Uh, you see going 100 kilometre plus at the same horizon level. Um, so that's Nat Horsbjerg. Um, that's the sedimentary log uh, we published from it. So everything's about a kilometre thick. Uh, so again, it brings its own problems. Uh, we went up that, logged it on a bed-by-bed -bed basis and sampled it through. Uh, so there's a certain challenge to it. Um, I'll talk about the boundary, which is up there, sort of above the Stensioberg formation. I'll just mention a little bit about the Brita Dahl formation. 
Uh, that's Debritadal. It's spectacular. It's about half a, a kilometre of vertisols. And they're basically soils, arid soils, not particularly arid, not particularly wet. And they just go on forever, red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green. So again, we measured through that. And what it shows you is it's arid most of the time. Um, the marked change comes at the top of the Stensio Bjerg formation, um, where you start to go green and grey and you start to get sandstones coming in. And the vertisols disappear and are replaced by calcretes. So what's happening is the climate signal is getting wetter and drier. So you're getting more wetter wet times and more drier dry times. Seasonality has gone up. As the boundary itself, um, it's the Obrachev Bjerg formation, uh, and uh, sadly, everything's at about 1,200 metres around the tops of mountains, and that's just beneath the Permian truncation. So it's not a terribly happy exposure, and there's a bit of alteration on it. Um, but what you see is a panologically defined DC boundary. You get the LN star spore zone there. Uh, then that's the VI, and the boundary is exactly coincident with this lake. Uh, there's Lepidophyta, which pops out and finishes at about there. Note that rock. That's that rock again, so just below the ridge, that's the start of the LN star spore zone. Here, where the hammer is, is this calcrete. So that's a very condensed, thick calcrete level, um, and so that's marking the aridity of the glaciation. So that's the glaciation, this is the deglaciation, and there is a pair as a couple. So when you've got this uh, severe glaciation reaching into Maryland at about 40 paleo south, uh, its warm-up is equally wet. Um, so that's the lake uh, measured through. Uh, there's a TOC profile, and it gives quite remarkable TOC values of up to 20%, uh, which are really quite colossal. And again, that brings problems to the palynology. Uh, there's the calcrete, that's the glaciation. So you can see we're quite short. Um, if it wasn't so high, you would notice that was 5%, which is a very respectable level uh, up there for TOC. And it's a pair of processional cycles. So that gives us a hint of the timing and what's going on. Uh, that's the calcite record. That's the, the back end of the Devonian isotope record, which you can get in the marine sections. And you get these spikes probably when the lake's closing off and becoming a closed system for a while. That's the panological record. Um, and what you see is that's the last of Lepidophyta there. As you go and as the lake encroaches, things get wetter and nicer in your arid environment becomes a wet one and you get diversity in the panological assemblages, and you get these other things coming in. That's, that's the nitidus of the LN star. Then you lose everything for about a metre because of the amorphous organic matter. So all of that TOC in there is microbial production. We know not what from. And when you come out the other side, the panological assemblages has changed, and you're getting a largely a simple... Uh, simple spores, and then Velati sporites, a little bit of diversity. And for the first time, we're seeing substantial quantities of Botryococcus um, in environments, early Carboniferous environment. And so you lose Lepidophyta, and you lose that one, which is all the hooked bifurcate tip spores as well. And it's just like Lake Chad now, um, so here's Lake Chad today, it, it's sort of the canary, so to speak, sitting on the edge of the aridity, and it's shrinking, that's what it does. Here's Lake Chad uh, at the warmest time in Holocene, and it's an enormous lake. And so it's exactly behaving like that. Um, and we're bringing the monsoon into as far into East Greenland, and it fills up the lake progressively. Um, if we go south, we can find other sections for it. Again, this is up at 1,200 metres, top of the mountain. Uh, DC boundaries there. Here we haven't got the Permian cut down, and we've, what we've got is preserved Tornasian section, so we can understand a bit more about it. And 
Uh, we crack the problem. It takes you about four hours to get up and four hours to get down these things. So we went and lived on the top. Um, that's John Lakin, who's from Yorkshire. So he built a stone wall. Uh, but <laughs> once... Once it got cold and night didn't come, the wind changed direction from that way to this way. Uh, so it was quite an interesting moment living on the top there. Um, what you've got, again, two procession cycles, uh, palinomorphs in the bottom there, and you get fish in this one. And you get the paleoniscid fish, these little ones, uh, actinops in there. And what Sarah Finney managed to find was half of a complete shark. And it's got teeth. It's got a body spine. And that was almost certainly predating on these things. And the unknown question, which hopefully we'll answer fairly soon with isotopes, strontium, is that, that was that a marine shark swimming up from the sea, 1,000 kilometres, or was it the, the earliest sort of freshwater shark adapted to this environment? I, I suspect it's a marine um, colonist. Anyway, what we were able to do there was count plant stems. So it's a measure of what the forest is doing. These are all transported stems. Um, but what we're able to do is count them against altitude uh, in the screes, measure them up for size, and there's all the records. And what you can see is the forests basically finish at the DC boundary. It wipes it out uh, in that place. And we don't get anything for the entirety of the Tornasian, and the forests come back as a different group of lycopods once you get into the Visayan. Um, so you can see these changes when you lose those uh, forest trees, um, and the sedimentary envir environment responds quite markedly. Uh, and you get uh, Gilbert-type deltas. So once you go into the next wet time, uh, of the next cycle, it's just flooding with water and it's a fairly unconstrained system. And our channel sandstones are all getting bigger and thicker. We're starting to get basement class coming in from the margins. And we, st we, we can actually see what's happening in the dry seasons because you get the reworked calcretes. So you've lost that vegetation which was underpinning everything and the whole sedimentary system behaves as if it's an early Devonian one again. Um, these are some of the extinctions, some of the survivors. So we lose the, the weed, the ruderol of Lepidophyta of some little lycopod. All the bifurcate tipped spores disappear. So this one's got um, multifurcating grapnel tips. Highly specialist. It's probably some way of, of it holding in a cluster uh, for reproductive purposes. There's about three genera, and they all disappear at the boundary. Um, we get survivors. That's um, Incahatus, um, which is a trilites. That's another ruderal which comes through. That's the seed plant. Uh, that's a herbaceous one, which again comes through and survives. Um, that's another survivor, uh, tucked away in the literature in different names, the inside of a spore has a different name as well from the outside, uh, so recognised in its own right. But that's Pittus. So if you go to the Natural History Museum, there's a giant tree parked outside, and it's that one. And that survives. We find that below the boundary and above the boundary, but again, highly disrupted. Um, Didocytes disappears. Didocytes is the spore of Rachophyton. That's the understory layer. So what we're losing are a lot of the big progymnosperms. sperms. We're losing the understory. So it's incredibly disruptive. It's maybe not necessarily a big extinction. It's just that you wipe a lot of the plants out from a lot of areas, and they basically go away on holiday somewhere, and they come back um, after the end of the Tornasian. So all of that forest evolution we reverse in the earliest Carboniferous, which explains the se severity of the impact. Um, and it was probably just maybe too cold, too, too cold and arid, too warm and wet in too fast a frequency, so it was effectively very disruptive on the sedimentary environment. And that is that. Um, thanks for Cass for getting us there. Um, it's always getting back it, it is always a useful thing. Uh, National Geographic gave us some money, which is always kind of them.
Thank you. OK, thanks, John. Uh, we'll just take one very quick question, I think. One at the back there. Yeah, so you're losing these scores that have hooks and things. Yes. Uh, there's something similar to KPG boundary, where at the KPG boundary, you're losing uh, pollen that have hooks to be basically for pollinators to transfer them from flower to flower. And those things kind of remind me of burrs. Is it conceivable they could actually be dispersed by arthropods or something, and that's why you're losing these things? Yeah. I we don't know what plants they come from. That's the first problem. There might be something Isoitalian. Um, certainly, we find them at the highest levels of the alluvial fans. So it may be a, it's a strategy that the mass of spores hangs together. We suspect there's a lot of unsuccessful reproduction in the Devonian. A lot of plants may grow vegetatively, and they put in a pretense of trying to reproduce sexually. And it's maybe that the ones disappear are the ones which are annuals, which it basically gamble everything on having a spore. <coughs> I mean, if, that, if something goes wrong, that spore's gone and you're gone. Okay.